And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to uh, David Lynch, who is uh, a neurologist from the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, CHOP. Uh, and he told me during lunch that he has over 400 FA patients that he actively follows. And so, 500 for the record. 500, <laughs> okay, okay, 500. Um, and so uh, he just has a, a wealth of experience and knowledge on this disease. And so he's hopefully gonna be able to impart some of that on all of us today. So welcome and thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Bonzi. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that very uh, nice welcome. I'll mention this is the first talk I've given on the road since pandemic. It's actually the first business trip I've been on, and only the second time I've been on a plane. So I'm going to bring it over to my slides right now. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm well, sorry for getting sounds good. Uh, and I will mention there's probably less clinical stuff and more. Uh, that's not where we're starting, but okay, let's go back. Uh, yeah, uh, let's go back to the beginning, escape. Okay, so, yeah, the, oh, wrong word there, there. Okay, yeah, slideshow, but back to the beginning again, yeah. Start. There'll probably be a bit more clinical research than clinical medicine here. So by training, I'm actually a neurologist, neuroscientist. It was long, long ago in the galaxy, far, far away that I got my PhD. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about not only clinical aspects of SA, but how they make us think scientifically, as well as the various other aspects uh, of the disorder. So these are two of my patients. This is a young woman at her first communion. She's now 24 years old. She's a social worker in Philadelphia. Uh, this young woman is now 20. She's a college student at a, in suburban Philadelphia. Uh, this, this picture is taken, I believe, at age 11. This picture is actually at age 5. And one of the most important things is obviously to see uh, how friendly and what smiles they have on their face. Uh, but the other thing I want you to notice is her feet, is that at this age 5, she is not yet presented for medical attention. But you know at this moment, if you're a neurologist, that she has difficulties with balance, simply looking at her uh, stance. And one thing which I will preach is that a lot of FA begins before we ever meet people. So what is Friedreich ataxia? It's a rare progressive genetic disease affecting roughly one in every 50,000 or 100,000 people in the United States. So without, we'd estimate there are four to 5,000 people in the United States, perhaps 15,000 people worldwide. Some people estimate as high as 22,000 people uh, worldwide. It is a multi-system disease in which neurological features are 100% penetrant. You will get neurological features, while the other features of the disease uh, are, do not occur in every individual. There is some amount of genotypic and phenotypic heterogeneity. Childhood onset is most common, and it's usually associated with a faster progression. The youngest patient I've ever met with FA was age two and a half. The oldest patient I met with FA, I met at age 65, and he is now 89 years old, and I have a video visit with him later this week. Uh, most of the onset usually is between ages 5 and 15, typically 10 to 15. By late teens, early 20s, most banal individuals are wheelchair bound and require assistance with their activities of daily living. We also recognize clinically before the genetic era, a form called late onset, which is diagnosed after age 25, where people look subtly different. They don't have as much sensory involvement. And it is truly associated with a slower progression of myra phenotype that we can distinguish statistically. I'm a neurologist by training, so I have to talk about this awful thing called neuroanatomy. Uh, and that's the way neurologists still think, and it has a lot of merit. FA does not involve the death of a lot of different neurons. It's a relatively modest amount. Loss of the large sensory neurons concerned with proprioception, where your limbs are in space, with a relative sparing of all the other sensory features. This gives rise to a loss of balance and coordination, and also a loss of reflexes. I will mention now and come back to later that most people have no deep tendon reflexes when we meet them, and most people will say that their pediatrician could never, ever get them. You also lose the spinal cerebellar tract, more specifically the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, which is in one-to-one -one synergy with the dorsal root ganglion proprioceptive neuron. So it is an eerie form of transsynaptic degeneration, which is not said to happen frequently in the mammalian nervous system outside the developmental period. 
One thing which has been underappreciated is the loss of the motor tracts and particularly the cortical spinal tract. Clinically, we don't even see this because it's covered by the other features of the disease. Until late, when a stiffness and spasticity arises, it's seemingly out of nowhere, but it's in fact been going on all along. You lose a particular area called the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum, which if you remember your neuroanatomy from medical school is the output nucleus of the cerebellum. Everything leaving the cerebellum going to limbs goes through the dentate nucleus. This gives rise to a very particular type of speech dysfunction, as well as some modest eye movement and abnormalities. Compared with people with other ataxias, eye movements are almost trivially affected in FA. Some people lose vision, particularly those who have early onset, and some people lose hearing, but it's a very unusual sort of hearing where in fact, it's at the level of the cochlear nucleus and the signals are mistimed. So you can hear people speak, but you have no idea of who is speaking and what direction it came from, giving rise to difficulty hearing, particularly in restaurants and in situations like the present audience. There's a subclinical myopathy. People may be a little weak, but they don't lose any muscle. So this is really only important early. There is basically a sparing of the cerebral cortex and the cerebral cortex so that people are essentially cognitively normal. Uh, my good friends in Australia will debate this to some degree, but it depends on how much you level the playing field to do the testing. Overall, you lose a relatively few neurons and the MRI scans are typically normal, particularly early in the disease. I think that's one of the reasons to be particularly optimistic about treatment with FA is the amount of irreversible tissue damage is relatively modest compared to other neurological disorders. It is, of course, a uh, multi-system disease. There is an early hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which can be progressive and severe, but is not always. I will also note that the phrase hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a bit simplified. That is initially begins hypertrophic, but over time it will evolve and not everyone goes through a hypertrophic stage, instead goes straight to uh, uh, fibrosis and loss of ejection fraction. You do get significant arrhythmias. VTAC and ventricular arrhythmias are not very common. It's usually atrial abnormalities and they can be independent of the stru overt structural damage. About 10 to 20 people get diabetes with type 1 early and type 2 late, and I know I'm not supposed to call them type 1 and type 2 these days, but it's really both a mixture of insulin lack as well as insulin resistance. About 65% of people are insulin resistant. It's not useful enough to be used as a good biomarker in trials. 25% of people have, uh, people have scoliosis, and about 25% of people have to undergo corrective surgery usually the people with earliest onsets. People have higher age feet, also called as pest cavus. The basis of this is not really known. And almost everyone with FA, out of proportion to their neurologic or muscle or cardiac issues, is fatigue. An overwhelming sense of being tired all the time, which doesn't clearly map to an anatomical location. Uh, at present, there's no treatment to stop disease progression. We have ongoing trials with small molecules, which I'll talk one about at the end. But really, we manage this by annual evaluation, supportive treatment, being sure that nothing secondary is going on that we would need to intervene upon, such as cardiac issues, uh, diabetes, scoliosis issues, vision issues, and of course, rehabilitative uh, functions are very important. Now, since you've had FA 101 and 201, you understand the genetic basis, but I will review it just to give you my perspective on it as a neurologist. Uh, Friedrich ataxia is, called, is an autosomal recessive disease. You get disease if you have two mutations in the FXN gene. The most common mutation, about 96% of individuals, is an expansion of a naturally occurring GA repeat in the first intron of the FXN gene. Normal genes are less than 30. FA genes are 100 to 1500. I think officially we might say 66 to 1500. There's a little bit of a no man's land in between. That's 96% of all alleles. However, about 4% of people all can have a single expanded allele and then a point mutation or deletion within the FXN gene. L106X was uh, so that uh, loose is replaced by a no stop go down. These two are missense mutations in which sometimes people do not get the traditional phenotype. In particular, I note that people who carry the G130V mutation, I would never have recognized them as having Friedreich ataxia. They looked fundamentally different. Some brilliant person inadvertently marked a box many years ago, which told us that that was actually FA. So overall, 96% of people have two GA repeats, 4% have a GA repeat and a loss of function mutation. Most of these are splice site, start codon, 
folding mutations, or in the case of R165C mutations where it does not carry out what is thought to be the prime function for tactic. So these 4% are almost all, with the exception of G13V, no mutations. There is a single individual in Turkey who carries two-point mutations, and I have not been able to figure out that phenotype. The, sure. It's different in that if you were, uh, what you will notice is that people with G, who carry the G130V mutation, and I've followed some out into their 60s now, they presented age 5 to 10. Presentation is probably based on the length of their GAA allele. They present with an unusual form of what we call spastic paraparesis. Their legs are, their reflexes are hyperactive, but absent ankle jerks, hyperactive in their arms. They are truly spastic. And you, anyone in this room would notice that they walk differently. Their arms are probably forever spared. Their heart is forever spared. They have a higher incidence of diabetes and a higher incidence of optic atrophy. Although that may reflect the fact that because they don't get cardiomyopathy, there is no early death in people with G130Vs. And even so they're in some ways less ataxic than they are spastic. I will note in passing that people who have late onset also are spastic, but they don't look anything like the G130V individuals. So it's not simply severity. There is something different, which I put out a treatise last week where I thought I had solved it. And then I shot my own hypothesis in the foot. So I will not be speaking anything more about that today. I have not found a solution to this issue, which if I do, we did find might tell us a lot. Uh, the G repeat correlates with the severity of disease. This is a paper, uh, graph from Alessandro Durer's New England Journal of Medicine article in 1997, age of onset of the y-axis, number of G repeats in the smaller allele. And you see this is a reasonable line, the longer the repeat length, the early age of onset. It's actually probably a hyperbola. Well, who cares? Uh, I, it's now 25 years later. This curve looks the same. It's not like there's some group, this is a selected group. It really looks the same if you did it now. You could also replace this age of onset with frataxin level in cells. You could re replace with speed of progression. You could replace it with neurological exam accounting for age uh, in particular. And this curve would look very similar. Now you notice at each one of these points, it's not a perfect line. There is some variability. Three obvious reasons. When we measure J repeat length, we measure it in blood, white blood cells. So there is a limited amount of somatic variability, not as much as what people would see in myotonic dystrophy, probably less than what you see in Huntington's disease, but there is some somatic variability. There also probably are modifiers. We haven't found any. Uh, and finally, the possibility that age of onset does susceptible to what we call ascertainment bias. Uh, when you look back, you may not be accurately recalling when you actually first presented. Okay. Yes, Christine. Um, Uh, very good question to talk about later. It's actually on a different slide. I will make for most of the missions and I'll give you the one which is a function mutation, R165C. It is stone cold normal. G130V is open for debate. In our hands, we find it mislocalized. In Merrick Naparella's hands in a mouse, he finds it not there. Now, we use human cell lines. They use mice, which is more accurate. Uh, and when we go look in blood, we see that it's there, but probably a little bit less than what we would have expected. So I will leave that open for debate. <laughs> I haven't figured this one out yet. Uh, returning a little to the biology, this is a slide I borrowed from my good friend Sanji Bidi Chandani, which I just have to say because I love his name. Uh, if you look at white blood cells, the relative mRNA, which is made in control versus for taxing individuals. So there's Q, uh, uh, PCR of uh, Fertaxin, uh, FXN mRNA. It's dramatically reduced. You can see that in addition, the protein levels are reduced. Looking at white blood cells, you could produce this very similarly in any tissue with a little bit of difference in the amount in a tissue distribution. It is deficiency, not absence. Everyone makes some protaxin, perhaps 5 to 10% of normal, depending on what cell type you look at. There is no aberrant protaxin. That means you don't have to cut out the gene. You can just upregulate what's still there. Carriers make 50% essentially, and they are asymptomatic. We have never seen 
a feature in a carrier with a possible accept, uh, increased susceptibility to scoliosis or something like that. We have never seen an effect in a carrier. If you look at Sanjay and Lane Ron's most recent work, they probably explain this by the fact that it is the number of cells which have completely inactivated alleles rather than the actual amount of frataxin that is the key feature. If you have a single active allele, that may protect you against disease. Patients who have point mutations are clinically almost, with the exception of G130V, almost identical to people with two GA repeat links. Uh, what does that mean at the scientific level? So the genetic abnormality is a silence of the gene leading to no, uh, little, I should not say no, diminished levels of frataxin protein. This is not thought to be an mRNA effect. The protein is the business end because the people who have point mutations where they make no frataxin have the same phenotype within trivial differences except for G140V. We haven't found any evidence of genomic effects. That doesn't mean they don't exist. We just need help. These are all null mutations, almost all of them. Stop, start code on splice site, folding mutation for tax and activation. The subtle variations phenotype are probably just the extremely low levels of protection you have when you have one of those point mutations. Almost all of them, you get more severe disease with point mutations. G130, maybe it makes a stable protein, maybe it's inactive, maybe it's mislocalized. I haven't figured it out. The paradox, of course, is that protection is a ubiquitous protein. Uh, FRDA is a relatively selective disease. So as we see in so many neurologic diseases, how does that actually make sense? We are continuously reevaluating this statement. I will mention that I saw two weeks ago two individuals whose, quote, point mutation, is actually a point mutation. It's a deletion of a full exon. They actually have some features I have, now that I knew to look for it, that I haven't seen before, uh, dysmorphism in particular. But I've not seen that in any other FA patient. The other question is, does frataxin deficiency itself alter levels of other proteins? There is no data on this. Uh, what does frataxin do? As you would have learned in FA 101 or 201, is its known function is to help chaperone iron sulfur clusters of the enzymes of oxidative phosphorylation, the Krebs cycle, fatty acid breakdown, and things like that, or even perhaps all iron sulfur clusters. This is, of course, stolen from a textbook showing that uh, FA is involved in the production of all the complexes. You know you can tell that I stole it from a textbook because if you look real closely, you can see the writing on the back page. Uh, I borrowed this from Rob Wilson many years ago. Are there, but the, knowing that this is its only discovered function does not mean that it is only function. There may be others. We continue to re-entertain that pro process. Are there extramotochondrial locations for taxin? Ian and Blair and I published a paper saying that. I agree that it's there. I don't know what it does. And does the simple existence of frataxin or lack of existence of frataxin change the levels or turnover of other proteins as it would if it's in a macromolecular complex? I will leave that as open as a question. So when I started doing work on this, it was right after the discovery of the gene in 1997, the pathophysiology was basically GA repeat expansions lead to gene silencing, which leads to a relative lack of frataxin. This leads to mitochondrial dysfunction and loss of iron sulfur cluster containing enzymes. This leads to cell-selective mitochondrial dysfunction and other clinical manifestations, and we get to wave our hands at that point because we're not actually sure how to fill in the boxes. And it's 25 years later, and I'm not sure how many of those boxes we can fill in. This is still the basic pathophysiology. What have we learned? This is, of course, uh, a well-known fair ambassador who raises money by riding his bike, and this is one of my uh, younger patients. Uh, what have we learned or what have we become able to do? Well, once, and this is footnoted because I remind people that I'm not actually trained as a clinical researcher. I'm trained as a basic science researcher who just got sort of drafted into this job because someone had to do it, you know? We need a measure, way to measure disease. That sounds obvious if you're a scientist, but in the clinical world, neurologic exams are not good measures of things. We need biomarkers and of this list here, this is the thing which we don't do as well as everything else. We have to have a large amount of natural history data so that we have a roadmap of the disease and know what happens because otherwise you can't design clinical studies. We have to have, find a way to find patients and that's what Ferris in particular use for with their worldwide registry, which has thousands of patients and we can recruit clinical trials in minutes, not weeks, literally. And of course, you have to have funding, which you know I think most scientists know, but I think it's underestimated in the public domain how important it is. We obviously have the wonderful support of Farah, as well as we've been generous with a lot of pharmaceutical company support through the years. I would say there's so much pharmaceutical company support because we have a registry, and we have a natural history study, so they know their experiments, as you would call them, are accomplishable. They won't fail for lack of subjects. 
So one thing we did, uh, Jennifer and I des designed, oh, in 2001, as a natural history study where we see people back every year. It's now at between uh, around 1,200 patients uh, and greater than 10 centers worldwide. We collect this information on everyone every year. We mix it with their clinical visits so that people come to us. It's all done in one. We help cover, defray some of their expenses. This gives you a roadmap of the disease. That seems trivial. It's not trivial at all. The first thing you have to do is be able to measure something. There was no way to measure free record taxing when we started. There will be no test questions on this slide here. Only to notice that we can take this exam, and this was done when there's only 234, so that's 2016. We're now, uh, it's got five years at that point. We're now, let me think, we started in 2002. We're now at year 19 of this study with almost 1,200 patients, and we can map the change in people over time so you can make sample size calculations. That is extremely important. I would basically mention that the longer you do studies, the easier it is to find things. And there's enough variability without stratifiers that if you, that's 9.62 units per year, plus or minus 8.3, that's not the ideal uh, standardized response mean that you want. That still predicts clinical trials where if you're two fellow plumbers, you'll be doing them in uh, 100 patients. That's not ideal. But fortunately, we've been able to develop a whole large number of stratifiers so that we can do a lot more with this. You all don't need to know those, but understand that you must do this to get to, to figure things out. In fact, the best stratifier is simple age. The younger person is, the better the standard response mean. And we can actually do studies of less than one year looking at neurologic function if we concentrate on people less than 16. The older individuals, the numbers are much worse. Why? Because they have later onset, they're changing slowly. And the people who presented young have reached the ceiling of the scales. Documenting this is hugely important with interaction with regulatory groups. This is what you have to have. You can also create other measures, which is our good friends in Silver Spring, also known as the FDA, don't like means and standard deviations. They like fixed endpoint outcomes. The amount of time it takes to go to a non-ambulatory status. The amount of time it takes to, in Parkinson's disease, it's all the, the amount of time you need to, you need a drug to treat the disease, these sorts of things. We've been able to calculate that so that we can thus use loss of ambulation as a direct or supportive outcome measure. And this is what natural history studies are good for. I would also, and this is the advertisement for people in the audience. We get samples every year from people, DNA, RNA out of lymphocytes. Uh, we have plasma and serum, uh, probably a thousand different individuals sitting in my freezer on five or two Abrams in a chop. Would anyone like them? Please just let me know. I'm happy to ship. We might need, if we don't have people want them, I'm going to have to buy a new freezer. Oh, yeah, we can, we have buccal cells stashed if that's something you like. Uh, fibroblasts, we have, I have biopsied about 80 different individuals. They sit at, U, sit at UAB with Merrick Napierella right now, and they can be used in differentiating uh, into iPS cells and any tissue you choose from beyond it. If people want muscle biopsy tissue, I have a limited amount of that. I'm, I have to be careful about advertising here for anyone who might want to help us participate. Uh, so a few things about therapy. Definitive therapy in FA is putting more frataxin in. If you, based on animal models, if you give, if you restore frataxin levels early enough in enough cells to a high enough degree, you block progression and it would allow the possibility of restoration should it be possible. Uh, those, sound, those are mice, not people. If you wanna do it, you can replace the protein either with injectable form, there are attempts to do that. You can reverse the inactivation, and I'm not gonna talk about that today. There are attempts of that going on. And you can do gene therapy to put a new gene in, which the results uh, in mice are impressive. Any one of these is important, but the truth is it's about like real estate, location, location, location. Where do you get for tax and back? That is what limits you, which requires us to ask a few questions. So people are not mice. The real question is which organ or brain drain, uh, region do you want to treat or which ones? And that's a lot of that determines, I have to figure that out, you have to know where you're going to target. So where do you target? That requires us to know neuroanatomy. I'll apologize in advance, my friends. Uh, 
if you go back to the textbooks, and you can throw away the textbooks on Friedreich ataxia, the large dorsal root ganglion cells are said to be the site of progression. And I would have believed that in 2000. Uh, but that doesn't make sense. My apologies. Reflexes are absent well before presentation. You tap on someone's knees, they don't move. And patient after patient will account the history that their pediatrician could never get them. Uh, you can look at the sensory nerve action potentials, which actually measure those cells. They're absent at presentation, not low, absent. You can do it another way where you do the somatosensory evoke potentials and you don't see them. But if you put a magnetoencephalogram on a person's uh, skull and measure their activity in their cortex, you can find them. They're very small and they're delayed. They're delayed because they're probably going through a different pathway to get there. This is the phenotype you see when something is lost very early and you've already remodeled your nervous system to compensate for it, which reminds us that people are compensating. If you do retain sensory nerve action potentials, they never change. Thus, they cannot be the site of progression. All the, and all the other sensory modalities die later. So we can't even prove the dorsal ganglion cells are there when we meet a person. And if they are, it doesn't seem like they're doing anything. I will mention my bias is that the motor cortex is the major site of progression along with the dentate nucleus and the cerebellum. It is clearly affected in some animal models. It's, and you can see clinical progression of spasticity late, but it's covered by other things early. People have Babinski signs for those people who are neurologists early. That's an upper motor neuron sign. And you can see slow progressive loss of the corticospinal tract. So now real neuroanatomy. These are two sections at autopsy, obviously. This is from a four-year-old from Toronto reported by the group there who died when they had a sudden cardiac event that at the time I didn't think was related to FA, but now I'm convinced it is. This is from a 28-year-old man who's been symptomatic since age uh, eight and dies of end-stage cardiomyopathy. Uh, the pink, that's gray matter. This is all white matter, and that's actually normal. This is edge artifact inside. This is the dorsal columns where the dorsal ganglion axons would run. You see there is no stain here. That's because their myelin's gone because the axons are gone. These axons are gone in this asymptomatic four-year-old. In contrast, in this person here who's had disease for a long time and is maximally disabled, yes, he has those gone, but this is the lateral cortical spinal tract, which is also degenerated. I would suggest that the difference between these two slides and what has progressed over time is simpler the lateral cortical spinal tract, and that is in some ways the target that we should be going after. You can also do a test called a motor evoke potential. This is done with Sue Kessler in our group with Ferris support, where you take a magnetic stimulator and put it right up here. And you can see your hand move. It's really sort of cool. Uh, and you can measure the size of the potential. What you can see is over the course of disease, you can watch that fall. That is a cortical tra spinal tract measure, nothing else. So we know that it's changing over time. You can also do it in another way. You can look at MR spectroscopy where we measure the amount of GABA in the brain. Uh, this is with Bill Gates, not the one from Microsoft. No, uh, it's a different one, uh, J-E-T-Z. And this is the, the red circles of the cerebellar dentate nucleus. You see a little bit of an increase over time as people get worse. That reflects probably what we call partial volume effect is that the GABA containing cells are preserved and the glutamate containing cells go away. This is the motor cortex where the GABA level was getting lower, probably because it's not directly, the cells aren't going away, but the amount of inhibition that, that GABA has to carry out is going away. So this is actually a pretty good biomarker. And it again tells us this cortical spinal tract is going away. Now, so, so the lessons I've learned again is that human disease takes place over a longer time and don't trust the original clinical information. There are clearly developmental aspects to FA. I'll mention that mice, knockout is lethal in just about every cell type, the exception being early astrocytes. Uh, that's a subject for another day. And we have, when we talk about FA, don't think that our acute and subacute models in a dish are necessarily good models of humans. They are ways to get to humans. They are not humans. You can think of FA as a chronic metabolic disease. Now, what I'm going to do is, since I'm running a little short on time, I'm going to talk about, we used to think you could treat this with antioxidants. That's clearly too simplistic. It's not, FA is not a disease where people are making large amounts of free radicals all the time. We have tried to demonstrate free radical and reactive oxygen species production in humans. We have been uniformly unsuccessful. There are a bunch of reasons you cannot see it, but we just don't find it. Uh, I'm gonna skip the data which says that we can actually measure this in platelets. 
and go to something else which on how this concept of the long-term effects might give rise to therapies. So one thing which was noted in the cellular models is while they didn't make free radicals, antioxidant gene response, uh, antioxidant response element gene expression was downregulated. It's under control of a transcription factor called NRF2. NRF2 is normally bound to keep one and is rapidly uh, keep one uh, in the E3 ligase, which takes it to the proteasome and allows it to be destroyed. When free radicals appear, NRF2 and keep one dissociate, thus leading to NR, uh, uh, ARE um, gene expression. For some reason, and this is not explained, NRF2 levels are paradoxically low in FA. They don't enter the nucleus easily, and you find them uh, gluttonated in the cytoplasm, and the genes are turned off. They ought to be rip-roaring high, and they're not, and the reason is not really understood at this time. However, it does. Uh, this is, shows it does happen in fibroblasts with FA. This is a measured phosphorylation of DRP1 done by Joe Johnson in my lab, which shows that you have an elevation in the amount of mitochondrial fragmentation, the amount of mitochondrial cleavage from DRP1. That can be reversed by adding an NRF2 activator, which interferes with its ubiquitination uh, by keep one. It's called RT408, also called omaviloxolone or OMAV for her firm choice. This would be a rational thing to take to trials. Actually, in a phase one study done in collaboration uh, designed by uh, Riata Pharmaceuticals, you can actually show that that exam-based measure, which I circled in red, in a dose-dependent matter improves over the course of three months. Uh, this is the data from the first phase one trial, placebo. Yes, there is a placebo response in FA, as there is in every neurologic disease. You look at all the doses, people get slightly better. If you look at the optimal doses, they get substantially better. Strangely enough, if you throw out people who have higher feet, the response is even bigger. I pre don't pretend that I understand that. Uh, it probably has something to do with what gives rise to higher feet in the uh, developmental neuroanatomy, but I'm not convinced of that. So this is an Reasonable drug for a phase one study. Obviously, uh, I'm going to skip that because I skipped the relevant things. They have now done a pivotal study, part two, people with FA baseline m at 20 to 80, you don't need to know that, age 16 to 40, 48 weeks, OMAV or placebo, primary endpoint is a change in the neurologic exam, so which is a relatively insensitive exam. Short story, people on placebo over the course of that year of therapy, worsened by an amount which matches natural history data, people on drug improved. And statistically significantly, this has been published already. This is what the actual curve looks like, and it actually has an interesting graph. In the first three months, there's no difference. But then you continue to accrue benefit and really stabilize. This is more the pattern I would have expected with a truly effective drug than an immediate response antioxidant. Uh, you can do one more thing. You can, this is that same graph. You can take people off drug here and you see that the effect goes away. Not all the way back to where the placebo group is, but most of the, a substantial amount of the way back. So it, that one does have to continue taking OMAP to see the benefit. And then what you can do is put everyone on the drug. This is a change over time, over the next 100 weeks. People who started on placebo, people who started on OMAV, and then changed. And I'll give you that those two lines are central parallel. So in delayed start analysis, it doesn't matter when you start the drug, it still works. And how does that compare to natural history data? This is the line of progression of natural history data of a matched cohort. In other words, it doesn't matter when you start it, it's effective, and it does far better than natural history da uh, data for at least three years. This is a good drug. But of course, always, whenever you do anything, you can never figure out what's new. Why does people with test cavus less response up? I haven't figured this out yet. Where's the anatomic site of Riata wor uh, OMAV working? I say that because there's not a lot of NRF2 in neurons classically. It's mainly a glial protein in the brain. And why was it ineffective to begin with? So the message being, no matter what you find, you've got more lessons to deal with next. So what did I want to say in this brief 45 minute tour? This is a multi-system disease. These decreased expression of a single gene. In some ways it seems uh, simple, but it's not. Uh, we have lots of natural history databases. We have lots of tools available to bring basic research into the clinical world. Uh, we have a wonderful infrastructure, courtesy of Farah, 
And with omovaloxone, we may have our first small molecule, but it will not reach the four-letter word cure. Gene therapy and protein replacement and gene reactivation is certainly important. Uh, each new finding, of course, leads to more questions. So I want to thank you for attention. Uh, these are the people who work with me right now in my lab. These are the, uh, my clinical group. These are the various collaborators right now. These uh, pictures, I should quiz Annie as to whether she knows who any of these are. This is a young girl with the wide stance. Uh, she's now a freshman in college. This was taken after her sophomore, freshman year of high school, I'll note. This is the daughter of another prominent researcher in the field, and this is my daughter here, who's a uh, sophomore in college right now. So I thank you for attention. And I guess I'll be taking questions at the end and I should call my patient friends, Alex Fielding, uh, Annie Hamilton, and uh, Nick Carbone up to uh, talk now. Or I should say not talk, I get to interview them. And in one of the most dangerous events, they've let me go with an open mic here. And if anyone got any extra questions for me to ask them? Yes, Doctor. If I may call you. No, Doctor. If I understood correctly, there is no obvious reason why some tissue, some organs are more affected than others. And I saw you had presented like levels of protein. What about my just mitochondrial level? So if, so you, if you associate good if you point. Yeah. The question being whether it, uh, what do we know about the tissue distribution? We've waved our hands about it's a level of energy production, a number of mitochondria. There's probably something behind that, but it's not a simple answer. The second one is that dividing tissue just seems to be far less effective. I'll give the best way is I could show uh, I'd love to talk neuroanatomy. If we go to the cerebellum, uh, the Purkinje cells have the highest levels of mitochondria. They do not die. However, we have evidence from mouse models that they are dysfunctional and not, and they're not, uh, they're not uh, firing as fast as they should. If you look at uh, activity related gene expression, it's down, it's down about sixty percent. So that maybe dysfunction, uh, the death is not the issue, but dysfunction is. Purkinje cells do have the most mitochondria in the cerebellum. The dentate nucleus wouldn't have been described as that. The corticospinal tract, that would be, again, it's a long neuron, but that's the biggest marker, and that goes with mitochondrial number, but it's not the absolute be all end all. And among the large dorsal root ganglion cells, it's really the proprioception more the vibratory neurons that die. So that mitochondria and link doesn't get you anywhere. It could be five different things which are determining it. <laughs> and I'm, but what it is not is simple for tax and expression. And there is about a twofold difference in the highest and lowest levels in the brain. And one quick question for Christy. Okay. So I want to thank all my friends here for talking. I've met them through uh, various times through the years. But at first, I just have everyone introduce themselves. So why don't we go from proximal to distal speaking. Alex, why don't you go first? Love to. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having us here. Uh, it's great to speak to you. And um, really good for us to share our stories, get to know you, and give you a little motivation on, on uh, the research and to help us down the road. So my name is Alex Fielding. I, um, I'm 33 years old now, and I'm, uh, I'm in that odd group that uh, Dr. Lynch mentioned of late onset. Uh, so a lot of the, uh, when he's going through patients don't have this, I had a lot of that. Uh, so I proved him wrong. Um, <laughs> I was formally diagnosed uh, when I was 26 years old, uh, so seven years ago. Um, and I was at the time living and working. I just started my career as an engineer. Um, I was in Texas at the time. Um, and of course, alone down there and uh, starting a new job, you find out something's wrong, finally get a diagnosis. That was it. Uh, so I'm originally from Rhode Island, uh, right down the road. So that's where I'm living now. Once I get diagnosed, I came back home, uh, had to figure out, you know, what crushing blow of uh, getting a, a awful diagnosis of that thing, what it meant to me. Um, but I didn't want to stop. My nature has always been, I'm very stubborn. I always want to keep moving. I always want to stay busy and do things. Um, so I was able to work for my family's manufacturing company um, in Rhode Island. Um, my father runs a company and he had lost his engineer a few months actually before I came back. So it's a good opportunity for me to get in and start working there and do things. 
so as of now, I'm actually the vice president of operations for the company. Um, so I run all the day to day. Um, I get to deal with all the problems and the headaches. Um, but it keeps me going. Um, it's getting harder, I would say, you know, as FA progresses, although I'm also where I'm in the luckier sense that I'm a later onset. So I have a slower progression and less severe symptoms at the moment. Um, it really uh, the type of thing, uh, how we get involved with Farah. Um, like I said, once I get diagnosed, um, I'm an engineer kind of scientist by background. So I printed out a stack of white papers. I started reading everything I could. I was going to figure it out. You know, I was, I was going to be the one that got to the cure. Thankfully, we have all of you because uh, I didn't get there. Um, but I heard about Farah, um, started getting introduced with other patients, getting to know them, uh, made me feel in a very scary and alone time in my life, uh, made me feel very comfortable, gave me the answers I was looking for. Uh, and really since then, I've, I've tried to get, stay as involved as I could, uh, give back and you know talk to newly diagnosed families and patients. And then also talk to researchers, clinicians, uh, pharmaceutical partners, um, you know, trying to explain anything from my day to day or the patient day to day that could help them direct their work uh, to a meaningful treatment because we're all in this together. So thanks for having me. Great. Thank you, Alex. Annie. Um, hi, I'm Annie. Thank you for having me. I'm 17. And I'm a senior in high school at Sacred Heart Greenwich. I live in Rye, New York with my three siblings. And I was diagnosed with FA at nine years old. And when I was nine, I didn't really like understand what was going on. I didn't really want to understand. Um, so I kind of knew that, you know, I had a disease that made me really clumsy and made a lot of things harder for me, but I didn't really know the extent of FA. So when I was about 11 or 12, it kind of became a lot harder for me to ignore. Um, because I just started falling a lot and like having a lot of symptoms. So I asked, I asked my parents and had them sit me down and they told me basically everything about FA. And that was really hard for me to hear. I didn't really want to come to terms with what was going on with me. I wanted to be normal. So for a long time, I didn't really tell anyone. Um, and no one really knew, except for like maybe two of my closest friends and obviously my family. Um, I'm sure everyone knew that something was wrong with me just because like I fell a lot and I needed a lot of support. Um, and then by like eighth grade, um, my walking started getting really bad. So by the second half of the eighth grade, um, I really couldn't walk anywhere on my own. Um, and I'm very stubborn too, so I didn't really want a walker or anything to help me. So I kind of relied solely on my friends to walk me in school from class to class. And then my parents and my siblings to help me at home. Um, so my friends were kind of saints in the way they kind of, um, you know, went and got me from my different classes and helped me 
to walk across the hallway to different, you know, classrooms. Um, when I was entering a high school, though, it a high school, the high school was sort of bigger. I had to walk to different classrooms. So that was when I decided to be in a wheelchair. Um, and that was a really hard decision for me. Um, but being in a wheelchair kind of helped me to come to terms with, you know, SA and what was going on because it sort of like let everyone know that, you know, I needed help and I needed support. Um, and then, yeah, I've been on a wheelchair ever since. And yeah. Okay, thank you, Eddie. And now, Nick, you can add and talk about whether you're stubborn or not as well. <laughs> A little. Uh, I'm uh, I'm Nick Carboni, and I'm exhausted. Uh, no, uh, really. Uh, speaking what from what I uh, Lynch was talking about, his PowerPoint about the fatigue. Um, that is something very real. Um, I'm very exhausted. Uh, Woke up this morning, went to work, uh, came here, already tired, could have fallen asleep at noon. Um, and now I have to go home and keep my uh, one-year-old daughter <laughs> and try to run back a house that we just moved into. <laughs> um, so that's a lot. But uh, so about my diagnosis, I was diagnosed with Friedrich's taxi at the age of 10. Um, I am 34 years old. Um, that means I met Dr. Lynch 25 years ago, too. <laughs> Not the date, uh, his age as well. But um, so, yeah, I was diagnosed at the age of 10. I have four siblings. I think my parents had a constant uh, comparison because there's only seven years between me and my youngest sibling and the oldest. Um, so we're all very close to age. Um, so my parents had a constant comparison. They could see the thing. Like my gait was wider. It appeared that I was tremoring when I would ride a bike or tie my shoes or plug in a uh, lamp. Um, so those are the kind of things that got that from Nordic. Uh, and then it was a significant journey actually, getting diagnosed at the time, um, as I believe it's referenced again in the PowerPoint, but um, at the time I was diagnosed, there was uh, very little research and, and doctors didn't know exactly what we were going on. Uh, exactly what was going on. I think we were floated. Uh, Dr. Lynch's name, who seemed to be one of the only people I knew about it, uh, as well as a handful of people in that uh, Philadelphia, D.C. area, uh, uh, Jen Farmer being one of them as well. Uh, so that, that kind of you know, through, through my diagnosis, it was certainly a hard time, a uh, hard thing to deal with. Growing up, uh, you know, I had younger siblings who were certainly excelling in sports uh, and um, certain other things. And I, I wasn't uh, progressing at the same speed. And that was, that was tough to deal with, uh, but, I, uh, but I tried. I tried very hard and I, I didn't go in a wheelchair until I was 22. I went to college. Once I went in a wheelchair, I kind of uh, wasn't sure if I could do just any job. So uh, I went to law school 
Um, became a lawyer, uh, practice every day still to this day. Uh, again, that's part of the reason why I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> but I'm in court almost every day uh, with my wife, who's here in the audience. Uh, she's my law partner and life partner. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, that's me. Okay, so that's very good. And the audience has heard now about me talk about FA and the things which they may be seeing in you. Uh, for each of you all, what is something you would note about FA that you want to tell the audience, which I didn't talk about? Something, uh, so they talked about fatigue, that would have been the first choice, but something else or a way it affects you, which they don't know about. Uh, Nick can start. Something else that uh, would affect. Uh, me that I think is surprising to, but you're hearing about it more and more in, um, I guess, in the rare disease world is mental health. Uh, the mental health issues, the depression, the anxiety. Um, I think that's uh, not uncommon for many of us and certainly not for myself. Um, now, that's just more challenges we have to deal with uh, on a daily basis. I did you. Annie, what would you say that people need to know about you that they haven't yet observed or you haven't told them? Um, I would probably say my cold feet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, like, bad circulation from my knees down. So it's really, my legs get really cold, but my feet throughout the day, they kind of turn purple and they get really cold, which is really hard because I can feel that they're cold. So all day they're kind of like ice cubes and that. Okay, I would mention that she is exactly correct. We don't, it's not in the textbooks, but people with FA develop intermittent bluish to purple feet, which is not macrovascular circulation. There's a group in Italy that is suggested, and I, this makes a bit of sense, that it comes from a metabolic deficit, and that the feet don't necessarily demand any energy or, or any blood flow, so they don't necessarily get any blood flow. Uh, that's the explanation they've given. It is certainly more common in people with FA than other ataxias matched for a level of dysfunction. That is not just feet heading down. There is a biochemical basis behind this. Good point. So, Alex, you now get to add something you want the audience to know that you, they haven't heard yet. Um, I'll kind of just add briefly to those two. For me, I'm not earlier on my progression. I don't get cold feet. I get cramped feet. And it's actually like one of the most painful things I've ever had is your feet cramps and you can't do anything about it. You just either have to reach down, like punch your foot and kind of bang it out or I just wait till I get through it. Um, so that that is kind of one of those weird things that no one ever really asks. And then to Nick's point, um, the mental health is huge, um, you know, with with energy and you hear us, you know, we're all. Um, stubborn, as we say, very stubborn, but driven people. Um, we're, you know, still trying to live our lives and be independent and follow our dreams, do what we um, have always wanted to do. But doing even the littlest things takes a lot more of our energy. So day to day, it's a constant um, budgeting of your energy. You know, very simple things of walking to a door, um, rolling to a door, opening a door, getting your room, getting set up. That takes a lot more focus and energy for us than a normal person that you don't think about. So like Nick said, we're exhausted. And when you are tired, you run down and you still have all these responsibilities. That's when mental health issues come into play. So, you know, constantly fighting depression, constantly fighting anxiety. Uh, the biggest thing I know we're going to, uh, I think we're going to talk about it a little later, is trying to plan for the future. You know, it's it's so hard to have a professional career and you have no idea if you're going to be able to do what you do now a year from now. 
Um, so that just adds into the anxiety for future planning. Okay, great. So yeah, it, I think it's a good thing. So how do, how do you approach planning for the future, Alex? Uh, <laughs> if I calculate correctly, you're the same age as Nick, so I'm gonna let you go first. Uh, <laughs> All right, good luck. <laughs> see if he ever comes back to see me at this point. Um, it's, I, I'll say I don't have an answer. Um, I'm actually kind of fighting it now because, like I said, I work for my father at the family business. We're kind of in that talk right now, of, you know, what are we going to do, you know, for the next 10 years in the business? I know he's kind of looking to exit and retire. Do I want to take it over right now? With the way things are going no, uh because you know i i know i'm gonna get worse i know i'm gonna progress so i'm gonna take on more responsibility i already kind of run everything now but even take on the high level business strategy knowing things are gonna get worse but on the other side you know i see all the research and i try to stay hopeful so it's well where things are going to be in five or six years you know might have make a different decision so again kind of going to that anxiety you know it's kind of that i don't want to get it wrong now but i don't really know how things are going to be in five years and i understand no one knows the future but it's even harder when you do know that your future as of now is going to be worse how do you how do you make plans on that so i don't really have an answer i think right now i just i know what i know and i kind of keep making uh, choices day to day around that, um, and what I keeps me going and what I want to do. Um, but longer term down the road, I don't, I don't know yet. Yeah. Would any of you and Nick like to add anything to Alex's eloquent description? Um, well, for me, I'm a senior in high school, so the thing I'm most worried about is college. So, um, like. I don't really get to think about like 10 years from now. I think about like next year because I have a lot of anxiety surrounding my college and it was a really hard past year because it was um, more of like, can I actually go to college? Um, and visiting the colleges like a lot of people don't think about it, but I had to think about, you know, was it accessible? Can I get everywhere? Um, can I do it on my own? Like, what do I need? So it was a lot harder for me to kind of go through like that college process. Yeah. And Nick, what are, you're planning for the future, what do you specifically think about? Uh, I, I think about uh, my children, <laughs> uh, my wife. Uh, you know, we, like I said, we have a business. My, I work for me now. Uh, and, you know, as long as she doesn't hit for the hills, I, I, I think the plan is for to take that over and uh you know my family did well financially speaking so i mean i'm not i'm worried about the future about my financial future about planning for that about planning for my children but um i do have um i do have people who are, are here to help yeah. um which is which is kind of a you know, it's kind of comforting, I suppose. It is It is a challenge having to think about all of the things you need to put in place and all the things you want to do uh, to make that happen. And uh, in this point, actually, I, I was thinking about myself um, going to college when, when I was 18. Now, I wasn't in a wheelchair yet, but I do remember... Um, kind of plotting out campuses like before I even went there like my how far is it going to be from the admin building to the chemistry building or 
things like that. And then again, we were able to walk that bar and, um, when I should have been, you know, thinking about what kind of light beer I want to get. Light you know, beer? I, <laughs> no, but it was, you know, we did in college. We did in college. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, that, that is, you know, that was a good point that you brought up. It really made me think about that time of my And, um, but in terms of planning, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So Alex mentioned one thing about uh, research and how it imp impacts a little bit on that. Now, I know you've each done at least some of the research, clinical research that we would have done. Most of the audience here, well, some of them are clinical researchers. I think most of them are probably basic science researchers working on molecules, cells, small organisms. What would you say that, what's your overall reaction to research? What uh, and where do you think the context is of things? Anyone could start there. Um, uh, oh, all right. Um, uh, for me, at least, there isn't a lot of like pediatric research or thing that I can qualify for and get involved in. Um, I do participate in the natural history study, but again, for pediatrics, there's not a lot of like medicine or trials or anything that we can really do. Um, I would love to participate in research, but again, there just aren't many opportunities. I would also mention one other thing, which is important as you go to college, is that for any study, the most important thing is you have to think about how it impacts your life. And I would, and once you're at college, off at wherever you're going to go, gonna go Yale or Yale or Yale, <laughs> then <laughs> you'll want to see how it impacts so that you can make it. Your most important thing is have fun for the next five years. You know, that's my opinion of college. I hope my daughter's following that right now. But in any case, so there are trade-offs there I'll mention as well. So if I don't see you back to after college, I'm not too worried about it as long as you're having fun. Any thoughts about research in general, Nick? Uh, so back when I was diagnosed, there was uh, very little, very little in terms of research. And uh, you know what? It, it is impressive to bring us here today and you see a a lot of companies in in this area, um, the area I grew up in, um, for taking research, and that's really important. Um, think about myself participating in studies and research is uh, uh, I'm not able to do a lot of the a lot of the research job, but I speak, speak with a lot of uh, biotech companies and that. Over the past 10 years, or probably maybe 20, mostly in this area. Um, but in terms of research, like going to university, a lot, a lot of times I don't qualify for that. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, one my age knocks me out of many of the research uh, studies, but also, um, you know, we talked about cardiomyopathy, and with that, I have, uh, I do have an ICD. Uh, and that kind of, um, that's kind of a factor that disqualifies me from some of them. Uh, there are newer ICDs uh, on the market now that are tending to change that and, uh, Something you could still get an X ray or an MRI with, um, which you know, when I, whenever I change this, that might be reason for me to get back involved with a lot of these studies. But uh, it's something I'd like to do, and you know, the fact that I'm not able to do it makes me feel um, that I'm not exactly doing my part. But uh, at some point, I have. To and Alex, you mentioned a little about research. Any particular perspective from you? Um, I would, I would just say, um, 
you know, from when I first started reading all the white papers, um, you know, kind of have that ignorant um, point of view of why haven't they done more? You know, why don't we know more now? Um, but then I've done a lot of, I'm in the natural history study, done several uh, biomarker studies. I'm in a few now, uh, done uh, studies for potential therapeutics. And now I understand and have a ton of respect for the clinical process. So especially for the research in the room, it is a bear. schedule one, and they're playing the track clinical site, go through the consenting process, all the basic exams, schedule them for all the different tests. So I've 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 a ton of respect for all the um, clinicians and the clinical site coordinators who do all that. They make it so easy for us. Uh, the other thing is I'm I'm lucky in the sense that. Um, with my job, I have some flexibility to come and talk to you or to go to a trial. Um, I've met a lot of patients that don't have that flexibility, can't get out or far from a clinical site. Um, so, you know, when you read a paper, you kind of just take all those data points as uh, uh, for granted. You know, each one is um, it, it's just astronomical you know, what it takes to get each of those uh, data points. So I uh, definitely learned a lot of respect for that. So one thing I also wanted to bring up, and I didn't talk much about it, is sort of an FAA for reasons which are not fully clear. It may reflect uh, the mitochondrial biogenesis aspect of it. Activity is a good thing and it reinforces it. I know I'd like to so talk a little bit about what people do for activity. Annie, why don't you start? Because we have a videotape, I believe, of some of the things that you do. Um, so I put you on the spot, but I was told to do so. <laughs> no, I do basically everything. Um, I do pretty much any kind of PT pretty much every day. Um, I get acupuncture done. Stim. Um, I walk in a robotic exoskeleton suit. Um, so I, I mean, I pretty much have everything done, and I really enjoy like being upright, and I enjoy physical therapy, like getting to work out and feeling like um like doing something good for my body. It's a really good feeling for me, for not only my body, but just like for me personally. We have some videos of Annie um, walking in her exoskeleton chair. Yeah, which I would note is quite important because the body is meant to be upright. That's a simple way to say it. Sure, give me a cue. <laughs> Not quite ready for the Tonight Show yet. Let's go call today, any or the late delay? Uh, virtual. settings on it. So one is actually when the robot is walking for you, it's like the robot steps and gate and everything. And then another one, which is what I'm doing here, it's like three legs, so it's basically my own walking. And the robot isn't really doing anything for me. It's just 
like keeping me upright and they apply resistance to him so it's like I'm walking against like resistance so it's basically like I don't know like really hard to walk so yeah I would not underestimate the importance simply because one of the things we've discovered in recent years by accident is that people with FA actually have thin bones at the time of presentation before they have difficulty walking. And the way you maintain your bones is to put weight on them and stay as upright as you can. So very good, Annie. Hey, there's, another there's another video. This one here. Do I get a cue yet? Yeah. Oh. Dave, can I just say the, the first the first robot that you're working on that has an exoskeleton, we got the knees. We have to get the knees through spinal injury clutch, right? There's no FA robot. Right? So the first one was a large, heavy, expensive robot. This robot she's in this robot she's in right here is a new robot she's helping a company develop. That's actually this robot here that she's got on is only 26 pounds and is um, you can actually take it apart and bring it with you. Um, it's in development. It's on like the third phase of development. But this robot actually senses when she starts to move her hip and will help move her leg to walk with this one. This doesn't have a resistant function. This is more of an assist robot. But, you know, we went from a robot that's, you know, a couple hundred K that weighs you know 75 pounds to this robot that's 50k weighs 26 pounds so wow. we made progress and i just feel like i don't want to speak for my own for annie right because she does it but you know just people being upright i mean for your even yeah. for your mental health right to be able to look people in the eye and this robot you can actually have wear the suit and sit in your wheelchair with the suit on so you could wheel up and actually stand up and talk to somebody I, I don't think that should be underestimated, the significance of standing up, not only for the physiological reason, but also mental health. And if I could tell a story afterward, uh, but I'll hold on right now. So thanks. Yeah, those are uh, impressive videos. I didn't realize how far things had come. I would also know one of the things which were asked commonly is, let's suppose gene therapy were perfect and we restored for taxin levels to normal in every cell in the body. What happens? The answer is, I don't know. Uh, but at that point, you get the opportunity to use the advances of spinal cord injury and all those things that Christopher Reeve brought forward, which right now we can't use because it's still a progressive disease. So the instant you stop the disease, other things become available and usable that you can't do now. So I want to finish by having one more thing. I want each, if each person could pick one thing they want to tell the audience about FA and one quote you might have, which you find inspirational. If you don't have a quote, I will provide one. It'll probably be from Springsteen. <laughs> uh, Alex, you want to start? That's why I had to write mine down. <laughs> so this quote, um, it's actually a plaque in our office. And when I was little, sweeping floors, cleaning bathrooms, cutting the lawn at the shop, I always saw it. So it's always kind of ingrained in my head. Um, but well, I'll tell you what I like in a minute. So this is a quote from uh, Calvin Coolidge. Nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. A new reward of genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. So I like that one because, again, there are days we've kind of touched on the fatigue, uh, some of the mental health battles. 
there are days you, know, you just want to kind of lay in bed and don't get going. But the reason, you know, we're all here, we're doing great uh, physical therapy work and trying to keep our bodies up and active is because we, we're stubborn, we have persistence, uh, we're motivated and determined. Um, so that's kind of the quote that sticks in my mind of, you know, don't worry about being the smartest guy, you know, being the most talented, you just gotta keep trucking along and we're gonna get this thing done. Very good. Andy. Um, I don't really have a quote, but like a saying I live by sort of, is basically like live life to the fullest. And um, I try to live by that because with FA being a progressive disease, you know, you're abilities sort of get taken away in the blink of an eye and you don't really know when like you can wake up and like not be able to do something that you could have done yesterday so for me i try to you know live every day basically and do everything like it's the last time I'm ever going to be able to do something because for me, it might be. Okay. Nick, you get the last word. Congratulations. Well, I got to say, I'm kind of curious about the spring thing, spring thing, folks. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, mean, I, I think I'll also add uh, some kind of at it because I don't have a quote memorized. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. And that's something that I didn't want for the longest time. Uh, and maybe that's because I'm stubborn, like any or Alex. Um, but uh, I think I'm starting to realize that now. Um, that we we do need need help. We need your support, um, and I'm not afraid to ask. So <laughs> very good. Thanks, yourself. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's actually a very good way to finish up here. Uh, that you know, but uh, we're here to help you all do the research that helps get us all across the finish line. So I want to thank my three panelists here. Thank you very much for making this such a great first meeting, at, uh, live meeting in pandemic. Thanks all for coming. And I want to thank Vonzi once again. And I guess we can have a reception now. Uh, Jen and I will be around now.